right, let's talk about the news. I'm John. There's Josh over there. There's Dave. Dr. Mike is back. Uh, guys, did you go to the cemetery uh, last week on November 1st? I'm guessing I'm the only one who actually did that here. Yeah. No. So, you know, Polish. Dave, Josh, nobody, nobody else went to a cemetery? No. But you've been to a cemetery before on November 1st, right? I do know what a cemetery is. But you've yeah. been, I mean, you've been on November 1st, so it's a big deal. Um, yeah, I've been on November 1st. Candles, yeah, it's, atmospheric. It's a nice day this year. Families. It's usually rainy and windy, but it's really nice this year. Practically short sleeve weather today. All right, bit of a different format for the news this week. Uh, we have so many subjects. We thought it might be a bit of an experiment to uh, take the, I call it the shotgun approach. Dave calls it the, what? Scattergun approach. Scattergun. So we're just going to go over uh, lots of stuff here. Rapid fire. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tee it up, and uh, the guys here are going to tell you what we think about it. Here's what's going on this week. Uh, let's start with, uh, let's start with, the, we talked about this before a few, uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago. The local prosecutor is going to proceed with uh, criminal cases against the owners of some of the uh, horse and carriages that you see in the Rennex sometimes for letting the horses stand out in temperature. I think it's above, what was it again, uh, 32 degrees is a criminal offense to let your sta- the horse stand there in the heat. But, but it's okay to use a horse on a farm if the temperature is above that level, guys. Fair, ridiculous, uh, feel sorry for the horses. What's going on? I know we're doing the rapid fire approach this week, but how many times are we going to talk about how horses on the Rennick? I don't care, dude. <laughs> Neither do I. They're, they're, wa- they're walking meat. I mean, it's, it's, they're talking about scatter guns or shotguns. They're just target practice. So what's the, the, the update? Like, I mean, they're just they're taking a case. Well, the update is the prosecutor is going to move forward. It's not just an accusation. The prosecutor, we are going to prosecute you. This is, we're going to take action against this. Well, we did speak. When we spoke about it last time, I think we were making the point that uh, while it is a little bit cruel and unusual to have a horse with people uh, being dragged around the, the main square in 35 degrees heat, would this be considered hard work for a horse 100 years ago? I'm not sure. I think these horses might have had it easy uh, next the to their forefathers. The whole point forefathers. of a horse 100 years ago. So not, not a lot of sympathy. Mike, no sympathy for the horse? Nobody no, not really. Horse. I despise horses. Harsh. Harsh. Moving on. Rapid fire. Um, news came out this week. Poland has issued more residence permits to immigrants than any other country in the European Union. Uh, this is probably a surprise for somebody who doesn't follow the situation with uh, with Ukrainians coming to Poland. Uh, guys, uh, what do you think? Does this mean Poland gets a bad rap when it comes to opening uh, its, its doors and its arms to uh, immigrants? Yeah, Poland definitely gets a bad rap about this. They they bring in a lot of people. I mean, even though Ukrainians uh, are culturally, uh, ethnically very similar to Poles, it's a huge amount. We're talking close to a million last year. Uh, no matter who they're bringing in, that's basically the limit that a country can of a Poland size can assimilate at one time. A quarter of a million last year, wasn't it? I think the, the statistics is it's total immigration. The total is yeah, like yeah, over a million now. A million that's work residents, yeah. Well, those are the official numbers. I mean, there's probably another 30 to 50 percent unofficial are here as well. At the same time, you know, peace do love to stand up and say, oh, we don't want this type of migration. You know, even if uh, the refugee quota would have only been a few thousand, then probably with a massive population like Poland's, you wouldn't have really noticed them. Uh, you know, they, they stood on that because they... Yeah, but bringing in people like that doesn't solve the problem whatsoever. I mean, no, it doesn't. No, 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 it doesn't. But all I'm saying is, is that Poland could get more credit for the amount of Ukrainian migration it's taken in. It's definitely eased the situation with the war in eastern Ukraine. You know, it's like, yeah, the Syrian war, it's like, yeah, we're all going to talk about the situation in Ukraine. Ah, oh, whatever. I get what you mean. Like, it's a good news story in a way. Poland taking in many of its neighbors. They're, you know, uh, integrated culturally. I think the arguments made quite regularly, and it's correct as well, that Polish, the Polish economy does need uh, those kind of lower skilled workers to come in. And oh, yeah, that's another jobs. thing. Then when these people come in, the majority of them work. Yeah. No matter what people might say about them, they, the majority work, which can't really be said for a lot of the people coming in from other nations into Europe. Speaking of migration, uh, this week, Polish Prime Minister Morawiecki, standing next to Angela Merkel, uh, announced that Poland would most likely not, translation definitely not, uh, be joining the United Nations Global Compact for Migration uh, Agreement, uh, joining a very small group of countries that includes uh, the Czech Republic, Austria, and the United States. Thoughts? More power to him, man. They shouldn't be joining any kind of uh, treaties or any protocols like that with the UN. What happened to European Union Brotherhood? They can go screw themselves. <laughs> well, look, there's no doubt it's been a huge schism in Europe, uh, the migration crisis. You know, Angela Merkel, it's it's perceived, took it on her own back to say, this is how we're going to deal with it. A lot of people didn't like that. It was seen as a kind of unilateral move by one of the 
the big economies. And in Germany, it's been very controversial as well. You know, that's why she's retiring. Uh, you know, AFD have had to do quite well in the last election. You know, it's a miscalculation from Merkel, the assumption that every other European state would want to take in its fair share, as it's always uh, called. Speaking of divisions between Poland and Germany, uh, there's another one involving something called the Nord Stream 2. Dave, tell us about uh, the Nord Stream 2. It's a pipe. <laughs> A really big pipe. Very important pipe. Yes. <laughs> what what would you like to know about well, this? What kind of pipe is it? This con- gas. It's one of the most controversial pipes in the history of pipes. Uh, basically, uh, Germany wants to run a huge um, gas train from Russia, bypassing uh, many countries to uh, end its own energy needs, which are, are, are getting more substantial since they're phasing out their nuclear program. It's very controversial for those reasons. But the, the, the conflict is is based in uh, disagreements over where the pipeline will go. I mean, the, the, the route, the path that it'll take, that's it. It also has to do with the fact that the more gas that goes through those pipelines, the less gas goes through Ukraine and other countries, which... Uh, which got a little money and a little political control because of that. Basically, Russia wants to get the Ukraine out of the loop and wants to get Poland out of the loop when it comes to the gas that they send to Germany and Western Europe. There's also the more, you know, the dual approach of are we are we initiating sanctions against Russia? Are we putting Russia in the naughty corner? And if so, where does building a huge pipeline, you know, come into play there? Surely that's rewarding them for their bad behavior. There is an element of that. Poland has always been strong against Russian uh, aggression. You know, it's always been the, the EU member state that, that, that stood up and made the serious point that, uh, you know, we have to defend that border with all of our might. Speaking of gas, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm really trying to, to link all these stories together as best I can today. But speaking of gas, uh, for those of you who've been in Krakow long enough, you know that in the last couple of years, we've got a new generation of buses, like public transport buses, right? Those nice, really long blue and white buses. And they replaced the previous generation. Of course, that previous generation uh, is for sale. MPK, uh, MPK the, uh, the Municipal um, Transportation Authority, announced that they're selling these old buses. Guys, any idea how much you can buy? You want to guess uh, how much these buses cost if you want to buy one? I'm guessing it's something like the value of their weight in scrap metal. <laughs> <laughs> 10,000 zlotys. Not bad for a bus. What would you do with a bus for 10,000 zlotys, Mike? Uh, I honestly, putting me on the spot here, I really can't think of anything. It's, I know it would have to involve alcohol and strippers somehow, but... The B- Krakow bus beer stripper tour. Exactly. Something like that. Dave, any desire for a 10,000 Zwati bus? Um, no, I'm all good for, for buses. <laughs> I have no parking in my apartment anyway, so uh, it would be just inconvenient, really. Josh? Not a lot, really, to add to this one. Um, buses are big. They have very, very, very high fuel consumption, actually. Where do you park a bus? That's a good question. I'm sorry, but my idea right now is just like in my imagination going off right now. I can just see girls like on those poles inside the bus swinging around. All right, calm down, Mikey. Calm tickets. down. Oh, you don't have a ticket. There's a fine for that. You've been I naughty. guess I should have clarified. It's an important point that these are not really for sale to individual owners. It's for other you know, bus services. I guess much the same like German buses and trams made their, from the 80s made their way to Poland in the early 90, mid-90s. Now, Poland is the one passing its transport along. Yeah, I wonder. So probably they're on their way to Lviv or, you know, Kiev. Or yeah, they're going to yeah. go someplace else. North Speaking Korea. of Ukraine, thanks, Josh, for that. Speaking of Ukraine, uh, in the news this week, because uh, related to Poland, of course, because uh, Ukraine might lose some territory to Poland, not because of war, not because of anything like that, but because of Mother Nature, Dave. I saw this. This is a cool story, right? Uh, I mean, the, the, the border is the river, the, as I call it, the bug, even though it's not how it's pronounced. I like to call the it. The bug? Yeah, I think it is bug, but I, I like to say the river bug. Uh, and it's shifting, apparently, as rivers tend to, which means that uh, Poland is eating up, uh, annexing, effectively, part of the Ukraine. Um yeah, I don't have much to say about it, but it's a very interesting uh, geographical phenomenon. What does that mean for the people? Well, no, I guess people won't be affected because nobody's living in the river, of course. So it's not like a village is going to change nationalities because the river moved, right? So it's just a geographical curiosity more than anything else, I guess, yeah? What I don't understand is why uh, they just can't make a declaration or something like, hey, let's, I know the treaty said that the river is the border, but since it's moving, how about we just say with like our satellite data, data that we'll put the line right here, you know, so we don't have to worry about, you know, changing the border every couple of years when the river shifts left and right. How warm has it been recently, guys? Seriously warm. Uh, record breaking, in fact. Uh, over 20 degrees last few, a beautiful day. Beautiful days recently, including November 1st, when we should have gone to the cemeteries. Uh, what do you think? Of, uh, probably a dumb question. Uh, does anybody not like the uh, the warm weather? Anybody kind of ready for the winter to really uh, set in? 
I despise winter. So the warmer it stays, the longer it stays warm, and the, the less cranky I'll be. I'm completely in agreement with that. Yeah, who's who's going to take the side of winter? I just I, I want the winter to start. Sick of this. It's like 22 degrees this week. It's bizarre. You're getting confused, Dave, with the return of Game of Thrones. Which is <laughs> a different kind of winter. Which is late. Uh, you know, I'm sick of this gap waiting for the last part of Game of Thrones as well. When's that? Next September? Two years it's going to be since it was... Dave, go on the record, make a prediction for the first snowfall in Krakow this year. <laughs> it will be white. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking more of a date, actually. <laughs> uh, the first snow this year will be uh, this year, I guess. Mm, I don't know. I remember a couple of years ago, we didn't get the first snow until like the day after Christmas, two days after Christmas. I think it's going to be a really cold winter this year. There was a brushing like last year around the end of November, so maybe this year. There will definitely be a brushing of some white powdery stuff falling from the sky, but... I mean, I'm Irish. I love talking about the weather, dude, but, you know... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are limits, yeah. <laughs> Dave, when was the last time you went sightseeing in Vavil Castle? Oh, uh, oh, it's oh, it's been a long time. I mean, why would I really? It's full of full of tourists when you walk into Valve Castle. So it's, this time of the year, still? No, it? not really. No, I could probably go for a quiet stroll if I was so inclined. But, Josh, how about you? A uh, very long time since. Mike, anyway. it's stunningly beautiful. It's been a long time. Probably some organized tour, if not like from university or something like that. Back then, ten years at least. Well, I mentioned because it's free this month, so we've got no excuse to go. We we, we live, you know. Actually, Josh, you live. Uh, what, seven minutes walk from Volvo Castle? Yeah, within sight of it. I Something think. like that. Yeah. So uh, you got no excuse or something. you to go check it out? I've got a good excuse for why not to go. It's open until four in the afternoon. So if, you, if you're an old, per, an old person has work and, you know, things to do, there's no chance you're going to actually make it there in time. The crib part is always closed as well. Anytime I'm up there trying to get in. I've never, I've never actually been down underground. I heard it's pretty cool. It's funny the number of people you talk to who live here, locals, who've either never been there or they went there once when they were in the third grade and went there on a school trip. You think it's weird that uh, so many people don't uh, or haven't seen the, the, the one of the biggest tourist attractions in the city? Well, I don't know, John. Is it like where you're from? Like the people from Florida don't actually go to Disney World? Or? Uh, yeah, our, our, our castle in, in uh, <laughs> the end of Main Street, USA. Yes, made of cardboard. I'll that bet one. you I'll bet you a higher percentage of Floridians have been to Disney World than Krakowians to Vavil Castle. I have to agree with that statistic. Yeah, but just I've noticed when I lived in lots of big cities, you never go visit these famous things until somebody comes to visit. Then there's a, when we lived in Chicago, we didn't go to the Sears Tower until somebody you know came to visit us. When we were in D.C., I didn't go to see the White House of the Capitol until a friend from Chicago came to visit me one weekend. Dave, Josh, I've never been to see that Da Vinci painting in Crack of Water. Uh, no? No, oh, I want to stand there, stroke my beard and go, are there what an airmean to, that is. To Mike's, to Mike's point, are there things in Dublin or Josh in London that a tourist would go see straight away that you've never seen? Well, I lived in London for 25 years and I have never set foot inside the Tower of London. Is that weird? No, I think that's completely normal. Unless, actually, as Mike says, if I had people visiting who really want... In fact, I seem to remember a couple of occasions positively dissuading people from going to the Tower of London because it was expensive and not really very exciting. Okay. Dave, uh, Dublin landmarks? Definitely the case that I only really started sightseeing in Ireland when I got married to a Polish uh, lady, a woman. Well, I hope you know what she is. <laughs> <laughs> Lady sounds weird. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, so then we start going to you know the Dublin, the Guinness Star House. The I even took an open top uh, bus tour of my own city, which was a uh, what a tourist interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. Other, beautiful what about other Krakow landmarks that you guys have never seen? Have you been in St Mary's Church? I've never been to the underground museum on the main square. I've meant to do that so many times. Yeah, I've been in Mary's Cathedral. The underground so. museum is, is is great. See the uh, Voss's uh, wooden. Alter place. Yeah, the triptych, I think it's called. Triptych, very good job. Uh, Josh, anything you haven't seen here in town? Um, I think with Dave, I haven't seen the Underground Museum, but that's about it, actually. I covered most, when I first came here, I did sort of hoover up most of the uh, major tours. Have you been to the top of uh, Ratush? What's that? The clock tower in the square? No. Why would you climb there? Have you been to the top of St. Mary's Church? No, but I've been in the the been? the, Have you been inside the wall, the Barbican wall? Um, you know, I've walked through the gate many, wow. many times. I've seen it. It's beautiful. Uh, everyone, for those of you who, who are not as familiar with the city, all the, the painting sellers uh, set up there. I love mm-hmm. that. I love that the way they I have seen it. the Leonardo da Vinci, though, and it is very, uh, very well executed piece of paintwork. Uh, salt. <laughs> How about well the salt done, mines? Leonardo. Have you been to the salt mines, Dave? Thumbs up from Josh there. Uh, I've been a couple of times. Dave, salt mines, Josh? <laughs> yeah, I've been, I proposed actually in the salt mines. You there proposed you go. in the salt mines to this Polish lady, huh? <laughs> 
<laughs> in the gift shop. I was going to do it in the <laughs> in cathedral. The gift shop. <laughs> I was going to do it in the cathedral, but I bottled it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, I got something for you here. Huh? In the, are you serious? <laughs> are you serious about the gift shop part? Yeah, yeah. I was like, let's go down to this secluded uh, corner at the bottom of the gift shop. I have. Some. I've been meaning to ask <laughs> for some. Oh, fantastic! Well, as much as I hate to leave that image, salt mines are amazing, man. It's like yeah, the, yeah, the as like much as I something now. Okay, it's like something now. I really Tolkien don't want to leave something. the image of Dave proposing in the gift shop at the at the salt mines behind to this Polish lady, but we have to move on. She said yes. <laughs> so there. <laughs> Completely unrelated topic. I have no segue for this I'm whatsoever. You know, volleyball is really big in Poland. Uh, guys, <laughs> <laughs> volleyball fans. Sounded like you literally have never heard of volleyball until you well, researched it this morning. <laughs> Anybody a volleyball fan here? No, it's serious. People are really serious about it, especially club volleyball and, of course, the national side. Uh, Do you know what? When it's on, I watch it, and it's actually quite good to watch, but uh, I know so nothing about it. I mean, nothing. I well, mean, a guy named nothing. Bartosz Kurek is named the best volleyball, Polish guy, of course, uh, named the best volleyball player in Europe. Uh, big deal or cause for ridicule and sarcasm? Well, no, it's a big deal in the sense it's a very popular sport and Poland are very good at it. So I suspect that's what's behind well, it. Well, they won the, uh, which tournament? We talked about this before. World There's championships. Like, they yeah, they won the world championships world recently. Champion. Exactly. Uh, double defend, world double champions. Double world champions, exactly. And if you ever go to, uh, I was in uh, Jejuv one day and there was a match there, a club match, of course. And the crowd was enormous, very loud. I mean, what you would expect at a, you know, a top level, you know, football match in, in, in other cities. And it was a really good atmosphere. And I think for a lot of people, they don't realize that volleyball is a thing here and has a you know, good, solid base of support. Yeah? You like watching sports you don't really understand, don't you? You're always going to football volleyball. matches when I knew you. No, the one I don't like and the one I make fun of is handball. Handball is a joke. I played Olympic handball when I was younger. younger. It is a ridiculous sport. It really makes no sense. It's nice. like somebody just sat around and going, you know, we can still make up sports. Like We're still allowed to do that. Let's have a, let's have a try at that. Send me hate mail if you want, but handball is ridiculous. It's just... Uh, it was the- I was a goalkeeper, which is a horrific position to play in handball. Uh, nobody wants to be the goalkeeper in any sport, of course, but uh, particularly so in handball. You're just... Uh, you're taking abuse. About 20, 30 goals go in usually in a game of handball. So it's... Uh, you, even if you're playing well, you feel completely useless. Dave, when was the last time you took a walk in the Tatra Mountains? Um, I'm not a great hill walker, but I've been up at the Tatra Mountains many, many, many times. Yeah. Josh, Mike, hill mountaineers. I don't stray too far from uh, licensed uh, premises, though. You know, like and the gift shop, like beer to be within reach. You know. uh, Josh, mountaineer. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I have walked a few gravel paths in the outskirts and <laughs> perimeter of. You ever seen a goat during your walks in the mountains, or any kind of you know substantial wildlife? Birds, not counting. You know, no squirrels, no, just something cool. You, are you leading into uh, an uh, apparently rather surprising uptick in the uh, wild goat population? Exactly where I'm going. This is big news in the, uh, bio, in the world of uh, biologists and zookeeper, animal people, whatever you call them. Zoologists. Zoologists, thank you. Uh, the number of wild goats is uh, apparently up, 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 up in the mountains. This is good news, I guess, for biodiversity. Maybe mixed news for people taking a walk, uh, you know, remote mountain trails or whatnot. Uh, would you be afraid of a goat if you came face to face with one? In the I wonder what decade they developed a reputation for sure footedness. You know, when, when did that become a thing? Like, it's so clearly a sign to the mountain goat, isn't it? It's sure footed as a mountain goat. It well, can't yeah, be any other that, animal. Dave, 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 this is Darwinian, isn't it? There were mountain goats at one time who were very not sure footed, but natural selection. <laughs> Played its part. Gravity. I'm talking about their um, their complete ownership of reputation for sure-footedness. There are many sure-footed animals, but the mountain goat seems to dominate the conversation completely. Like, it's lovely you don't to say, say sure-footed as a gecko, which is hanging upside down from the ceiling, you know. <laughs> exactly. So would you be afraid of a goat? I'm curious, because goats, goats freak me out. Well, they have horns. <laughs> they, they totally freak me out. They are kind of uh, biblical-looking goats. Like, you know, I like them, I like them, yeah. Sure. So you would pet them? You, you, you no, I'd stay away. I'd show respect, you know. But I wouldn't respect be. Uh, I wouldn't be essentially worried it was going to charge me. I'm not, I not, don't think the goats are violent animals, John. Would you? Uh, would you blow one away with a scatter gun? <laughs> I'd use a shotgun. Dave used a scatter gun, I guess. Um, measles. Let's talk about measles. No segue again from goats to measles. Do, go- do goats get measles? I know maybe they do. Uh, a couple do of goats measles? get measles. It's all get, here I on the no idea. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> Mike, you studied med- you. you studied medicine. Uh, can you throw any light yes. on the goat measles I'm a, topic? I'm a person doctor, okay? <laughs> he 
treats ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe goats for a hobby. I don't know. Oh, uh, isn't that more of an Irish joke right there? No, it's Scottish joke. Do animals get measles? Serious question. Do animals get measles? Or is that a human thing? I honestly Real answer. Don't know. I would. What kind of doctor are you, my, my God? <laughs> I would assume they can. I would assume they can. It's a virus. A lot of viruses spread right. between livestock and people like pox. Well, anyway, a couple of outgra- uh, outgrapes, outbreaks, and outgrapes of uh, measles recently. One in Warsaw. Um, some people are linking this to the growing trend of anti-vaxxers. Uh, others suggest this might have a migration link with a number of uh, Ukrainians. Sorry, Ukrainians, but the fact is there's a serious measles situation in Ukraine. Uh, guys, what do you think about the measles? Well, there's no doubt that anti-vax movement has caused a um, drop, a small drop in the amount of vaccinations total. And commensurately, we have seen a small rise in cases of measles uh, across the Western world. It's uh, sad, really. We uh, invent this perfectly good way of obliterating a disease and then we slowly allow it to uh, warm its way back into our population. Mike, give us your professional medical take on this measles situation. Well, at this point, the uh, uptick isn't that serious yet, but it's coming to the precipice. But basically, it's, uh, what, about a dozen people just outside Warsaw, which half of them were one family that decided not to get vaccinated. So, of course, that's going to be all those people at one time getting sick. But that can become, you know, the starting point for the disease to spread. When we talk about migration, yeah, that's an issue as well, especially from countries that might be more lax when it comes to their regiments of vaccinating children. So there's more likely to be a reservoir of the disease there when you get people moving around and then you have people who don't use the vaccine in the new country. Well, that just gives a a place, a foothold for the disease to start spreading. Isn't it possible, like five, seven percent possible that you can have your vaccinations and still get measles? I think it's even less than that. With measles, I think it's like 98, 99 percent. Success rate. So what, what's your take on the anti-vax, without getting political, just from a medical perspective, is there any basis for the anti-vax From a people? medical perspective, it's idiotic not to get vaccinated. Uh, I, from a political standpoint, philosophical, uh, philosophy, you know, discussing whether or not the state can impose this kind of thing, that's there for discussion. I still think it's dumb if you don't vaccinate yourself and your children, but you, there's a little bit of room, wiggle room for debate there, but... From is there a state. risk, though? Is there a real risk? In America, in a lot of states, you cannot enroll your kids in school right. if they haven't been vaccinated. And that I think that's sense. a very clever way of legislating it into people's lives. It's ridiculous that we allow it. It's, it I'm sure, Mike, you'd, you'd agree that it, when it's somebody's child or whatever, it's their opinion that that's what caused it. It's no facts to back it up. But, you know, you can't. You, it's very hard to tell a mother, on a, say, on a radio show, sorry, you're just completely wrong about that. You know, and there's no evidence to support it. People indulge, you know, the anti-vax movement because it's mostly people with horrible stories, you know, about how their their Well, these stories do, you know, know, some once in a while there are bad uh, side effects, but this happens on this, you know, on a scale of one in one hundred thousand, one in two hundred thousand. If you weren't vaccinating, then you would have a lot more people getting sick. So, you know, just looking at the stats, you definitely want to uh, vaccinating people. Is there any? I I don't know much about. The anti-vax movement and why they believe what they believe. But is there a real medical risk to vaccination? Is there a downside? Once in a while, somebody might have an allergic reaction. Something might happen. But the, the chances are so small. They're so minor. It's like you're more likely to, you know, cut your hand on the bus and get an infection that way. Uh, so it's know, more of a libertarian kind of, you know, government can't tell me what to do. It all goes well, back the to anti-vaxxers the- all started with the fact that like, oh, there's mercury in it. Oh, it causes autism. Oh, you know, so many people get sick. They blow out the negative statistics mm-hmm. completely out of proportion. It all goes back to this guy, Andrew Wakefield, the British physician who pr- published this ridiculous paper that was pulled apart by every medical journal at the time and it just won't die he's just like this determined every anti-vax documentary always features this guy he's been uh, I believe defrocked by the British Medical Board long ago Uh, you know it's just ridiculous like they're the most well studied uh, medicines in the world because the United States has the database from all vaccinations going back to the 90s so it's it's the only medicine where you can actually track its effects on millions Hundreds and millions, millions and millions of people, of people are getting vaccinated. So we can actually see the statistics, the correlations, and they're minor. Yes, once in a while something happens bad, but you know, you, you can uh, open a, up a beer and drink it and something bad can happen to you just because statistically something could be in there like a dead rat's ass or something. Yeah. Government released some statistics. We are on, anti-anti-vax on this. We're anti-anti-vax. Government released some statistics this week on uh, income tax, strangely enough. Interesting uh, nugget in here. Um, first of all, a bit of background. I told you the about the highest, word nugget, didn't I? The highest, we did talk about that. The highest, Please stop using that word. The, the interesting nugget I'm referring to here <laughs> is the fact that the highest income tax in Poland is 32%. 32%. So to be in this bracket, the rich people bracket, you have to make 80, let's call it 85,000 zwaties a year. 
gross. That's an average of about 7,000 a month. So let's call it roughly five, five and a half thousand Swalties net every month puts you in the highest possible income tax bracket, right? Now, this tax bracket has been has not changed for a, a decade, over a decade. So I'll start the, the, the question, the conversation by saying, if you were in this tax bracket, would you bother going to work if every Zwati you made, you had to give 32 groschen to the government? Well, yeah, I'd still go to work, but you know, for those people that are earning just below that amount and knowing that like, oh, if I get a raise here of a couple hundred zlotes, all of that is going away for taxes. It's like you not, might not be motivated to like work those extra couple of hours a week. Doesn't it seem like uh, a low threshold for being in the rich people bracket? It's Poland? one of the lowest in Europe, yeah. And you also have to remember like the low tax bracket before that is what, 18%? Yeah. So it's a big jump. Right, right. It's, you know, it's like 70% or more. Tax. You know what always gets me? The meanest part of the tax system is when you get a, an annual bonus and it's like, in, it's the same in Ireland, they take like nearly 50% of it. It's just like, come on, dude. You know, what a kick in the nuts. You're taking half my bonus? Well, the, the, the interesting, again, the nugget here that uh, really stands out to me is the fact that, of course, more and more people are in this higher tax bracket because people are making more and more money, right? Wages are rising and more and more people are making money. And more and more people, according to the government, are rich, even though they're really not. So do you think this will lead to political pressure to kind of tweak the uh, income tax brackets? Well, Cookies has been talking about this ever since they were elected. And this is one of their main like topics was discussing about the changes in the tax uh, code. Peace, of course, doesn't want to change it all because... Uh, their base are people that earn less, or rural residents, etc. But people earning more are, you know, urban, educated uh, individuals that peace, you know, knows they're not going to win their votes anyway. So they don't really want to change the tax system, especially since for them it's easy money. Even though, like any economist will tell you that, you know, you can lower the tax rates a little bit, switch them around, you probably would collect more money in tax revenue than with the system they have right now. Last thing we'll, uh, oh, sorry, Dave, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, there is a point where higher taxes will lead to, to, to um, less collection, the famous Laffer curve, but I don't think uh, 30 whatever percent is, is close to getting there. In Ireland, uh, we have the same problem. The tax bans had to be lowered during the recession, so the top one kicks in in Ireland at a measly €38,000 per year, which means pretty much everyone, you know, ends up in that in that highest bracket, and then when you add in the social charges, etc., the effective rate is over 50%, so... Yeah, taxes are high in Europe, John. So you work Monday, Tuesday, and half of Wednesday for the government, and you get to keep the rest. Yes, but remember when you're buying stuff, you're paying that 20-odd percent VAT tax on all your products as well. So you only get to keep some of your money, and then most of that money that you're spending, you're giving to the government anyway. Yeah, stop taxing our bonuses. That's my main point, my idea for the tax system. Oh, you, you want to save some money? That's also taxed, you know. Last thing we'll uh, cover today, and something that's going on as we speak, is the election for mayor, of course. Between uh, Jacek Mahrowski and Margaret Wasserman. Uh, guys, it seems like there's zero drama left at this point, or not? All right, don't we have to observe the election blackout uh, before oh, the runoff? Oh, yeah. We're not going live. Don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> oh, wait, we're going to get fined and, you know, attacked, whatever. Yeah, but uh, I'm guessing that Mahrowski's going to win. But, but I think it's going to be a very tight margin for him, not what a lot of people are expecting. Just because I'm assuming most of his voters are basically people that, ah, he's going to win anyway, I'm not going to go vote. Or a lot of people that support him in the first round don't really care enough to go out again. But while Wasserman's voters, they're all going to go out to all the ones before. And maybe a small percentage of people that don't want Majdowski will get mot motivated to go vote for her. I think it'll be a tight election, though. So, uh, a lot tighter than the first round of elections went. Guys, what do you think about the, the format of forcing a runoff, making sure that somebody gets 50%? A good idea to give them a mandate or an unnecessary extra expense? don't like the term runoff either. We should change that. It should be, you know, championship of the mayor or something. I'd like Michael Buffer introduce it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get ready to the vote. vote. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right, with That's why Michael Buffer doesn't indulge in get the vote programs. He's way too cool. Oh, he should. It would be really cool, though. <laughs> Busy sipping. Well, that's going to bring our uh, shotgun, scattergun, whatever we call it, uh, bits of nuggets from the news this week to an end. Thanks for joining, and uh, make sure you give us a like on Facebook. We'll see you next time on the news.